It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the Shannon Shire Memorial Lecture. The Shire family has always demonstrated a deep commitment to Judaism and the Jewish people. And one of the ways they've done this, of course, is through the support of Jewish education in helping us bring in speakers like uh, Kenneth Stowe. We're grateful to the Shire family, Milton and Joyce, uh, and to Milton and uh, Shoshana's children, Joyce, his mother and friends in memory with a generous endowment to Beth Sedek. Our speaker tonight is Kenneth Stowe. Um, it's a very lengthy uh, CV, many, many publications, many, many uh, books and articles. He is one of the leading scholars of medieval and Renaissance uh, Jewish history. In fact, uh, I often assign uh, many of his works uh, to my students to read, and I'm happy to tell them that they actually uh, like reading his stuff. Um, <laughs> Professor Stowe received his uh, PhD <coughs> from Columbia University in 1971. He was a graduate of the combined program of Columbia and the Jewish Theological Seminary. He's a uh, professor emeritus from the University of Haifa uh, in Israel and has had many uh, visiting professorships. And in fact, we're pleased at the University of Toronto to have him as, as our Shoshana Shire uh, visiting <coughs> professor there. To talk about his scholarship isn't easy. He's written uh, so much, but I've managed in my own way to uh, reduce his wide-ranging scholarship to three uh, main areas. One would be uh, the, the history of papal policy uh, towards the Jews. And uh, to give you an example of his book in that area, is Catholic Thought and Papal Jewry Policy, 1555 <coughs> to 1593. A second area of Professor Stowe's is the social and religious history of the Jewish community of early modern Rome. And an example of his scholarship in that area is his book called Theater of Acculturation, the Roman Ghetto in the 16th century. He's also written many uh, synthetic works uh, dealing with Jewish history in the pre-modern period as a whole. Most notably, his work, Alienated Minority, the Jews of Medieval Latin Europe. And most recently, and this is a work I admit I have not read yet, is his book, um, Jewish Dogs, An Image and Its Interpretation. And I believe that Professor Stowe tonight is going to speak to us about uh, that image of uh, Jewish dogs. I'm curious about it because it's something that I've run across in my own work on Catalan-speaking Jewry, where the Catalans would often refer to Jews as pans retayat, which is to say, circumcised dogs. Um, I don't, I'm kind of curious about this problem because I like Jews and I like <laughs> dogs and I don't really see what the problem is. Perhaps <laughs> Professor Stowe will enlighten me. Whoops. Just a second. Well, well, thank you, Mark, for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, after, after tonight, you won't have to read the book. You may not want to read the book. Uh, and uh, what, what I would uh, like to, to open with, actually, is uh, uh, how this book came about, although that's not directly the subject of the lecture. It's, it's, it's what's behind it uh, and the problems, and perhaps even going uh, a little further as we go along. Now, a number of years ago, I was listening to a lecture. It was an introduction of a book by Marjorie Agosin. I don't know if anybody knows her name. Uh, she is uh, originally, if you can't hear, come up front. There's plenty of space. If you don't want to come up front, the mic, the mic, is, the mic, is, mic is most definitely on. And I'm not going to raise my voice, so you're going to have to move up. Ah, ah, there we go. Um, OK. I said I couldn't raise the voice because I already lectured today and I lectured yesterday. And uh, Anyway, I, I was listening to a lecture, it was a presentation of a book of letters between Marjorie Agosin and her friend Emma Sepulveda. Yeah, it really wasn't on. Uh, and uh, 
Marjorie is a, is a poetess, uh, she teaches at Wellesley, she's Jewish, uh, Chilean by origin, and she tells of a game that she played in school when she was young, and it went something like this. My classmates, as though innocently, and this is a letter she's writing to her friend Emma, who is not Jewish, my classmates, as though innocently, called me to join in a game. They made a circle and told me to get in the middle. I saw all of them with their white aprons, and suddenly their faces went dark, became threatening with me in the middle of them, and I felt the press of the group on my shoulders. There was nowhere I could run or die as I heard them yell. ¿Quién robó los panes del horno? Who stole the bread from the oven? And the chorus responded, Los perros judíos, the Jewish dog. They said it slowly, and I was deeply hurt. The practice was also then to strike the child in the middle. Now, when I heard this the first time, and I had not met Marjorie in person yet, my mouth dropped. And she said, your mouth dropped. I said, Marjorie, don't you realize it's a host libel? The bread in the oven, the host, the dog stealing the host, trying to purloin the host, and then being punished. It's very clearly exactly that. And I ran home that night, and I started doing research the modern way, Google. And I ran into all kinds of amazing things as I began. And this was just the beginning. And it began to link up, actually, with other things that I was doing. Because I found a wonderful site. You can't access it anymore. It's so scurrilous, they got rid of it. It's called holywar.org. Now, when this site comes up, the first thing you say, oh my gosh, what do I have here? It tells us Dick Cheney, George Bush, Colin Powell, who was still in those days, all labeled as racist Jews. Now, we won't comment on the three, but uh, whatever they are, they're not racist Jews. Uh, and then it went further. Suddenly, I saw 123 heresies of Pope John Paul. Now it was, became Pope, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, although I think that the heresies more belong to John Paul because he, on certain issues like Jews, as we'll eventually see, was infinitely more open uh, to new ideas. But in, in the event, uh, this is a, a wonderful site if you want to see all kinds of texts of blood libels, if you want to see the connection between blood libels and anti-Zionism, if you want to see the connection between blood libels, anti-Zionism, and arch-conservative <laughs> Catholicism. I mean, arch-conservative, I mean it makes the Vatican look like it's a left-wing radical organization. Okay? Let's understand. I'm not talking about the organized formal church. I'm talking about people who are way, way, way to the right of the formal church. It all goes together. And many of these sites, of course, have been picked up by the uh, Islamic sites, the, the very radical <laughs> Islamic sites, but we're going to stay away from them. The question then is, apart from the radicalism, uh, is there a continuous fear of Jews? And by fear, I don't mean that people quake when Jews walk into the room. I'm not talking about that. I mean a disquiet, an unease, a feeling that there's something that, that, that isn't quite right about Jews being Jews. That's the issue. Is it there? Is it not there? Now, we certainly saw it in that blood libel in reverse, better known as Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Christ was a blick victim of a blood libel in that, in, in that movie. I mean, bloodied, mutilated by the Jews, and so on and so forth. There's none of that in the Gospels. But there is in the blood libel stories. And what Gibson was doing was simply repeating the whole thing in reverse. What most people have not realized, and a lovely article was published in the journal they edited. That's my fourth job. I've been editing a journal which I founded called Jewish History for 22 years. And maybe that's been my, 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 my signal achievement because of all the young scholars that I've been able to work with over the years, which gives enormous satisfaction. It's like an army of postdocs. Um, in, 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 in the event, uh, in the, what, what this movie, what it really is, is a remake of Cecil B. DeMille's The King of Kings. This, everything is the same except for the, the, the ultimate violence in the whole thing. And what many of you don't know is that DeMille's mother was Jewish. Although he himself was, she converted and then he was raised as a not Jew. Now the question is, we might ask, 
what is Gibson's model? Where do we have to go to look for this model? And what does it tell us? And at this point, we're going to go to the, uh, to the computer uh, and show you some uh, pornographic pictures. But not the kind that you think. The kind that I can show. <coughs> Let's see if we can get them. Uh-oh. We had it all set up so beautifully. There we go, all right. Now they're all set up and all we got to do is, okay, this is, this is the whole picture and we want to make it large. And now we can see this thing as we have it here. Uh, now at this point I have to have this mic on, but I'm not sure this mic is on. It says, it says on. Oh, it's for you. Ah, so I have to raise my voice. Okay. No, no. The, oh, oh. That's a. That's. There we go. All right. Now, now take a look at this thing. I hope maybe maybe we can knock off the lights just just a second and see the whole picture. Uh, yeah, that's better. Now this lovely little painting. Maybe I better get back because I'm blocking Rabbi Tannenbaum. Uh, this lovely little painting is actually hanging in a church in a cathedral in Sandomierz, Poland. It's, uh, it's mostly hidden. The picture was taken um, uh, very uh, unobtrusively. In fact, it was, it was uh, somebody simply had to, to, to almost purloin the picture. You, they, they don't want you to take a picture. It's actually part of a, a 12 pictures, uh, all cases of martyrdom, okay? Now, the victim of the blood libel, of a ritual murder libel, is a martyr. And here indeed we find the whole story. Uh, the whole story except for the very end, which I'll tell you, which couldn't have been painted. Now first of all, notice the colors. Red and blue. Those are the colors of the Virgin, okay? Those are the co color of the Virgin Mary. And the point is that she is the hidden eminence who's saving the victim. You see, the Jewish elders, clearly Jewish elders, with the child. And the child, who is the child, we'll find out in a second. In the middle over there, there's a barrel, they're taking the child, it's the whole story compressed. They're taking the child, their nails, can you see the nails? We'll, we'll soon show thumbnails of this thing, and you'll see it better. Their nails, and they're collecting the child's blood. And there's another, I think it's a Jewish woman or something, trying to seduce a, another child. The child now is being dismembered, killed, dismembered, and eaten by the Jewish dog. And how do we know that the child is the martyr? Because you see this child there lying out with a knee bent? That's a classic view of Jesus in medieval art. So that the story is what you don't see is the dog then vomits the child out because how could a Jewish dog possibly take the Eucharist. The child is the Eucharist. So here is the Jewish dog. There's no question about what it is and what it means. The Jewish dog is the one who attacks what? Not just the child, not just the victim, not just Christ, but the Eucharist, the corpus verum, the true body of Christ, the, the church, the corpus mysticum, the mystical body of Christ, Christ and the physical body of Christ as well. And we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Uh, Joseph, let's just take a look at the thumbnails, if we can, so that people can see it uh, a little better. We don't know if, if, we, if it gets difficult, we'll just pass on. But we can certainly leave this. Uh, it's down here. We can just go in there. Unfortunately, it's not a sophisticated program, but now you can really see them taking this child. Uh, then the, the next one is of the barrel, and the third is of the dog. There's the barrel. Huh. Well, I think we're okay. It's big enough. Let's see if we can get the fourth one, because if not, we'll be...
Oh, that's too bad. Well, at least there we see it. Now, now we'll turn the lights back on, but let's just leave this one up so you can enjoy the rest of the lecture thinking about the dog. OK. But now, this picture creates a lot of problems for us. These images, these really negative images, create a great deal of problem. OK, the other way, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. <coughs> They create a great deal of problems. And why? Because Pope John Paul II, in the year 2000, went to the wall in Jerusalem. And there he talked about Abraham and his descendants, giving great, uh, a great uh, sense of respect to everybody. Now, Abraham and his descendants in Christian parlance can also be Christians. It, it could even be Muslims. He was very clever. He had a good speechwriter. But the point was, one got the feeling he was doing this as he was putting a prayer in the wall. One got the feeling that somehow there was a real respect for Jews and Judaism. And later on, I'll bring you a reason even more uh, to think of this. Now, the Holy War site accuses the Pope of being in support and being in favor of freedom of conscience. In other words, Jews can believe as Jews, and Christians can believe as Christians, and Muslims as Muslims, and Hindus and Buddhists. And so here you have a reversal. So maybe, what am I talking about here? Well, you have a Chilean uh, game, and you have Mel Gibson's Gantz <coughs> Shiga, and, 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 and heaven knows what else. But here is the pope, uh, the, the most important pope in the last uh, any knows how many uh, decades. Uh, and he is going the other way. So that there seems to have been a very great road that's been traveled. Uh, uh, Catholicism, at least, and I'm, not talk I'm only talking about Catholicism. I don't know anything about the Protestants after Martin Luther and John Calvin. <laughs> Uh, uh, even, even the ones that boycott Israel. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, I'm talking about Catholicism. They seem to have gone a long way. There seems to be an end to fear. There seems to be an end to the doctrine which is known as supersession. That's spelled with an S. Supersession. And what that means is that in place of Judaism has come Christianity. And if the Jews were once chosen, now Christianity is chosen. And one has to, one has to recognize that Christianity is the truth. Now that's exactly, exactly what Pope Benedict XVI has been saying, whose name, by the way, comes probably from a, a, an early modern pope who really was pressing a kind of crusade again. And that's, that's the key to what this pope is doing. Now, I'm a, I, I know uh, Riccardo di Segni very well. Riccardo di Segni is the uh, chief rabbi of Rome. I've known him for over 30 years. And he came and he, he was in Vancouver a couple of years ago. And he got up and he said, you know, I had dinner with Ratzinger a couple of times as Ratzinger. And what he tells you in public is what he really believes, that there's no religious relativism, that there's only one truth. So there is supersession still alive in the heart of the Catholic Church today, even though his predecessor, John Paul, and after all, he was John Paul's theological advisor, seems at least publicly, as we'll see at the end, he seems publicly to have eschewed and said, no, we're not going to have it anymore. So let's see, you know, is it really ended or is it not ended or where is the problem? Because obviously the ultimate key to an end to fear of Jews, an ultimate key to truly living side by side with Jews for the Catholic Church is being able to overcome this doctrine of supersession. This doctrine that, the, that Christianity is the only truth and that Judaism is not the truth because as long as you have that somehow or other you have to look at the Jew with a jaundiced eye. And I would add that I'm going to try to speak as a historian, not as a publicist. That is, I'm going to try to say things exactly as a historian would by historian's methods. Now, the fact of the matter is 
that certainly until the mid-1960s, there's no way to deny that this doctrine was still alive. I could go on and on and give you examples, but one thing is very clear, that we have articles in the Catholic Encyclopedia that came out in that year, articles which still are saying, you know, with, with, with blood libels, uh, maybe they didn't say maybe the Jews did it, but they're saying, well, we have to wait for more scholarly research. And if they really wanted to say there were no such things as blood libels, that is, the Jews who are uh, envious of Christians, Jews who do not like the fact that Christians are trying to supersede them, <coughs> that these Jews are trying to attack, just as this Jewish dog in the picture is. There's still a lot of ambivalence. But in one case, somebody who is trying to say no had to stand on his head to say no. He writes, is a very distinguished theologian by the name of Gerard Maton, and Maton writes, well, the jury is still out. We need more serious studies like those of El Fage Vacondar. Now, I'm sure that none of you have ever heard of El Fage Vacondar. It's very hard to get a Vacondard's book. Vacondard was a high school teacher in France, very educated, at the turn of the 20th century. And Vacondard wrote a book collecting all the instances of blood libels, that is, not of the libels themselves, but of people reviving the libels. And that included, and in particular, a, a, a newspaper which still comes out called La Civiltà Cattolica, still comes out in Rome, and other such things, Jesuit uh, organs. And what, what Vacondard Vacondar did was to condemn the whole lot. He said, this is a pile of rubbish, it's absolutely unsubstantial, it's a blot on the church. And so, what we had with Vacond, what, what, what Maton was doing was saying we need more studies to show what a pile of nonsense, how much nonsense these blood libels are. But he was really still in a situation of being in a semi-minority. At the start of the 20th century in particular, there was a great deal of support for libels like that of the Jewish dog. We know that uh, Cardinal Mary Del Val, the uh, uh, Secretary of State of the Pope, was doing everything not to really reveal papal letters that had existed for 200 years saying the blood libel isn't true, we've studied, we see Jews do not use blood. The whole thing, however, and this is very important to understand, is not an issue just between Jews and Christians. It's an issue between, within the church itself. At the start of the 20th century, there are forces within the church called modernists and anti-modernists. The anti-modernists are ones who want the church to stay the way it had always been. The modernists are those who are saying, you know, science and philosophy and learning and true piety can go together. And there are many examples of this. And these people were constantly being opposed by the traditionalists in the church, and it was the traditionalists who were raising blood libels. For instance, we, we, we hear of some uh, young teacher of mathematics who is a, a clergyman, and he's being denounced by a papal legate in France as the ultimate Dreyfusard, support of Captain Dreyfus, of course, and a Judaizer as well. Judaizer is a code word meaning for someone who behaves like a Jew, does Jewish things, and essentially is one who is carnal in nature, somebody who is not totally spiritual in nature, which was the ideal of Paul as he founded Christianity. Pichot, this, this Abbe Pichot, was also guilty of humanism, meaning liberalism. That's where it all goes together. Uh, another fellow named De Paul, who is touting a uh, supposed martyr named Lorenzino de Marostica from the end of the 15th century, said the Jews don't want to kill a Christian, well, you know, uccidere il cristianesimo. They want to kill Christianity itself. Those are his words. Another one says Jewish blood, Christian blood rather, is the Jewish Eucharist. There are all kinds of amazing pictures like that, as though Jews need a Eucharist for some function, which doesn't at all fit with anything in Judaism. The Protestant Ludwig Feuerbach in Germany said the Jews are guilty of an alimentary theology, that is a theology of the stomach. Judaism, again, is completely carnal. 
Now there was opposition. I mentioned Vacon Dard, other people like Franz Delich, Ignaz Dellinger, people who really opposed this, but they were clearly in the minority. Now what was propelling this? What was there? What propels Benedict, Pope Benedict today? The clear need to be first, to be chosen, to replace, to supersede. And the way to prove Christianity had been chosen was to show that Christians are physically pure. Now this is the point of the talk. You, are, you, you claim to be better. How do you claim, how do you prove that you are better? by showing that you are physically pure and therefore worthy of the Eucharist. What is physically pure we're going to see, but I'll give you a hint. Read the book of Leviticus because they're citing it. And this ideal stems from Paul, Paul in Corinthians. And Paul, as we know, also read the book of Leviticus and other books. However, by the fourth century, there's an addition to this, this notion we have to be pure. Paul talks about flesh struggling against spirit. Because John Chrysostom, a bishop in Antioch in Syria at the end of the fourth century, who had a particular problem with Jews, but we won't go into that, was anxious to show that Jews were truly impure, unfit, unworthy, and they were dogs. And in parsing a verse in the Gospel of Matthew 15, 26, in which a Canaanite woman, and who knows what the Canaanite woman is, comes up to Jesus and says to him, give me some of your bread, and he says, the bread is for the children not to be thrown to the dogs. And who knows what the Gospel originally meant, but certainly by Christmas day we all know what it meant. It meant the Eucharist. It was for the children, the believers, not for the dogs. And he says, when Christ said it's not fair to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs, he meant that although those Jews had been called to the adoption of sons originally, they fell to kinship with dogs. While we who were dogs received the strength through God's grace to put aside the irrational nature which was ours. Jews are irrational. If you're rational, you believe in Jesus, by the way, and therefore you're human. That's Thomas Aquinas almost word for word which was ours, and to rise to the honor of sons. Once the Jews were the children and the Gentiles dogs. But see, now hereafter the order was changed about they became dogs and we became the children. So the chosen are pure, the rejected are impure. And that's the key, that's the whole problem. Purity and impurity. If you're pure, you're chosen. And if you're impure, you're not chosen, you're rejected. And not only that, but we'll see that there is a further step to the process. Because the attitude persists. After all, this little story that Marjorie Agosine tells, Marjorie, Marjorie is uh, uh, an adult woman now, full adult. The game is still being played in Chile. Now, I don't know if the children have any idea what they're, who, who play it, have any idea what they're doing, but the game is there. It's still being played. I've had people tell me as, as uh, you know, in, in the last year or so that it's being played. So it does exist. Now what exactly is this dog doing, however? Well, we already saw it, right? Stealing the Eucharist, taking it out of the oven. And indeed, there's a story of, of a Jewish father who tries to throw his son into the furnace because the son wants to take the Eucharist and become a Christian. And this story is only 1,500 years old, more or less. And it gets repeated and it gets changed. And we know absolutely that it's the Eucharist because there are versions in which a bread is thrown into the oven and what emerges is a child or a Christ-like figure. So the inversion is there. The Jews are trying to steal it. Paul reflects this, and by the way, I would add even more, what's the origin of this thing? Apparently it goes back to the ancient Hittites, one of the ancient Near Eastern people, who tell you that a temple will be polluted if a dog and a pig enter. So the cho cho choosing of the dog is not accidental. 
And though, of course, we can find dog imagery all over, if you Google dogs in books, Jewish dogs in books, you find about 50. They're not mentioned in this book. Google books, Google books didn't exist when I was writing it. I'm very sorry, because had I known it, I at least would have made a reference. Go see, but it all winds up to be the same thing. Uh, it exists in Shakespeare, too, by the way. Uh, but in any case, uh, the, the, the whole point is there's the notion the dog pollutes. And how does he, how does Paul express this? That's the interesting thing. He does it in 1 Corinthians. Now everybody here who know, knows what, what I'm talking about, right? Paul's letters, which are in what's called the New Testament, and he writes letters to the Romans, he writes letters to the Galatians, and he writes letters to the Corinthians, all right? And they come before his epistle to the Romans. People usually read Romans and then the other because that's the order they're found in the New Testament. But in fact, it's really the other way around. He wrote those, and then he went back to write the, uh, the epistle to the Romans, which in my very humble estimation, I'm not a Pauline scholar, I think was actually an appeal to get the Christian uh, church in Rome made up of Jews and Gentiles to send money to the starving Jews in Jerusalem. So you think the United Jewish Appeal was born today. Actually, the Onim and Bab in, in Babylonia invented all these titles that we give to people who give money. We have a list of about 30 titles. Well, let's get back to our subject. So, Paul in Corinthians says, your body is a shrine of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The fornicator, with a literal or figurative harlot, sins against his whole Eucharistic body. So Paul is worried about this, and the dog takes the place of this. And what he means is sins against the body of Christ and the church and the Christian unity. Now, he's talking actually in this case, he's attacking those he calls Judaizer. He means people who do Jewish practices, because Christianity... Paul's belief is based totally on faith. So if you, if, you, if you circumcise yourself in particular, then you can't believe. Belief has to be total and whole. And Paul says uh, anyone who, who does anything Jewish ruins this. That's a kind of pollution. And indeed, what does he tell us in what may be the most important verses in the entire New Testament? In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, he says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being one bread and one body, we are all partakers of that one bread. Unos panis multi sumus. One bread, we are many, in the, word, in the Latin of the Vulgate, which is so direct and so clear about this thing. We're all one. We are one bread. That would mean, wouldn't it, that if somebody steals unworthily or pollutes one drop of that bread, it pollutes everybody. We're all together. We are one loaf. We're all together. And that's the Christian idea, the church idea, that they are one body together. And, and indeed, Paul goes on and says this in many other places. Where is he coming from, though? And this creates the problem even further. Because after all, if this guy, this, this renegade Jew, is coming up with all these ideas and they have no foundation in Judaism, Jews can look at him and say, but in fact, this comes from Yechezkel, Ezekiel 44.7. Because Ezekiel says, you have brought the uncircumcised of heart and body outsiders into my sanctuary. They pollute my house when they offer the sacrifice, my bread. Note the use, which is the fat and the blood. Their abominations violate my covenant. Ezekiel is really saying the same thing as Paul. And Paul, in verse 18, goes on and says, Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. In other words, what Paul is saying, what Paul is taking Ezekiel, right verbatim. Ezekiel says, who can partake of the sacrifice? The pure, those who are really Jews. And the Christians have to be pure and purely Christians and totally Christians. And it all has to come together like that. Well, even this, we could still say, okay, it's, it's mitrash, it's exegesis, so what? The problem is that exegesis can become reality. 
And later thinkers ask the question, how does this impurity, and I realize that the Pauline doctrine presented so quickly is very difficult to grasp, but it boils down to all Christians are one, touch one, you've touched them all, and later exegetes go at it and say this, and, and that it comes from Judaism almost in a competitive kind of way. And, 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 and the question is, how do we preserve the purity of this bread, therefore? Not, but not just by, against Judaizing, but from within, but from without. And thinkers ask how impurity passes. And what do they do? They cite verses from the Tanakh. Leviticus 7.20, they're citing. Whatever soul shall eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of salvation, which is the Lord's and his uncleanliness is upon him, that soul shall perish from his people. Okay? So there, there you go. If you touch, if you eat wrongly, you will perish. And in particular, a fellow named Cyprian, in the middle of the third century, reflected on things that had nothing to do with Jews. He reflected on priests, Catholic priests, who were being persecuted by the Roman emperor. And, they, and the emperor was saying, reminiscent of the book of Maccabees, I suppose, the emperor was saying, go and sacrifice in front of the pagan altar so that I know that you belong to the imperial cult. And they were going and doing it, and then coming back and offering sacrifices. And Cyprian calls these people lapsi, people who have lapsed. And he goes at them left and right, in and out. And he says, these people are impure, and they pass their impurity. He cites, he cites Haggai, which say, who talks about defilement, how it passes through eating and at the table. And it's very important that it passes at the table. He cites Hosea. Such sacrifices shall be like the bread of mourning. All who eat of it shall be defiled. In other words, one has to have clean hands. We've all heard of Niki Kapayim, right? The Pharisaic notion. These things are all coming right out of Jewish exegesis. You have to be pure. You have to not come into contact with impurity. Coming into contact with impurity makes you impure, and you pass that impurity on. It's kind of a Christian version of Nida, isn't it? It's exactly what this thing is. So that one is not pure, one's hands aren't clean, one comes into contact with the harlot. And indeed, later on in the Middle Ages, when Jews and harlots are being dressed equally in yellow, one can say if A equals B and B equals C, Jews are harlots. Jews are sources of pollution, sources of corruption in society, and one has to stay away from them. But in particular, one Agobard of Lyon in the ninth century takes the doctrines of Cyprian and transfers them directly onto the Jews. Because he sees Christians and Jews eating together. This is in medieval France. Obviously, there are not a lot of Jews. They're together. And Agobard simply cannot take what he's seeing. He, he finds it absolutely hard abominable. And he said, don't we have laws which prohibit anyone defiled by a banquet of Jews from eating with any priest of ours? The heads of the church enjoined all social fraternization with Jews. They prohibited anyone who has become impure through fraternizing and dining with Jews from breaking bread with any of our priests. It's a sacrilege for Christians to partake of foods coming from Jews. We Catholics would be inferior to Jews if we partake of those things which they served to us. What does inferior mean? Inferior means that, that we would become polluted. They would become the pure all over again. In other words, if you have too much familiarity with Jews, if you eat with Jews, if you partake of things with Jews, needless to say, if you have sexual relations with Jews, you are corrupted. So much so, so much so, that we have a fascinating case of canon law question in the 12th or early 13th century in which somebody raises the question, what if a man converts from Judaism to Christianity and his wife says, well, I need a little more time? May he have sexual relations with her during that period? And the answer is no. Only when she converts. It, sexual relations between a Jew and a Christian corrupt, as I said, a doctrine of Nida. Now, of course, 
we should not think, and this of course is where the problem is coming from, we shouldn't think of course that Jews looked at Christianity and looked at it very kindly. Jews said all kinds of terrible things about the Eucharist and sometimes with a certain degree of sophistication. In one medieval text, Yosef Hamakane, he says, what we eat, I should have copied the Hebrew here, what we eat goes down to the belly and what goes down to the belly goes down to the drain and that's what they eat on Kasach. Uh, okay, I, I once actually knew what Kasach meant. It's, uh, there is such a word. He doesn't, he doesn't mean just Pesach. And in fact, the sophistication here is, obviously it's attack on the Eucharist, but the sophistication here is that everything until, and that's what they eat, is a citation from the book of Matthew. So the Jews were reading this material and they know. The book Nitzachon Yashan in the 14th century said, how do we know the Eucharist is a false sacrifice? How do you think? Because it's not offered in Jerusalem. All sacrifice has to be offered in Jerusalem, right? So this is a false sacrifice. But more by juxtaposition, he plays around and he says it's really cannibalism because it's sacrifice to the molach. He does this by, by, by the juxtaposition of sentences in, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, Devarim. We find them to giving it back to the Jews. The goy is a dog. And if a woman who has just gone to the mikveh sees a dog coming back, then she has to go back to the mikveh again. She's been repolluted by the sight of the, of the goy. Now, don't think the Jews are outdoing the Christians, because sight indeed can pollute. There's a text from Germany from the, from the 15th century in which it says the Jews saw the Eucharist they heard the Eucharist in procession, and that was endangering the purity of the Eucharist itself. These things really go on. Christians accuse the Jews of saying that the Eucharist in procession is really a dog going by. So indeed, the Jews are trying to steal the bread and worse. They're trying to steal the host. They're trying to corrupt the host. And all three of the libels of Jews attacking Christianity, <coughs> the persons and so, unite. And we know they not unite. It's very clear because we have the story of the good Werner. The good Werner is some 14-year-old boy in about the year 1287. And what happens with Werner? The Jews want to get this Werner to, to steal a host for them. But Werner is a good Christian boy, and he refuses. And so the Jews get furious, and they take their anger out on Werner, and they shake him upside and down. And as the text goes on to say, they wanted the corpus verum, the true body of Christ, the Eucharist. They couldn't get it, so they took it out on the mystical body of Christ, that's the unus panis. That's the one loaf. That's the church. It's the body of all Christians together. And they took it out, but of course Werner is a real child, and they killed him, and they took his blood, and so on. And then it says, and Werner therefore suffered in place of Christ, for Christ, and to, pro, and, and to, 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 to enlarge upon the salvation that Christ brought upon us. It's as though the martyr is not only Eucharistic, and in all the literature the martyrs are Eucharistic. It's as though this martyrdom is needed in order to continue the salvific processes began by Jesus. In other words, it's something we really need. The Christians really need this whole concept of martyrdom. So why should they give it up? And again, the story is illustrated so marvelously here. This picture is, is so incredible. It truly is a picture saying more than a thousand words because everything that I'm saying gets boiled down in this picture. You don't believe me? You don't believe what John Chrysostom says? Take a look at this picture because that's where it all is. It's all there right together. The Eucharist proves that also that the corpus verum, the Eucharist, will survive no matter what and that's very important. Many people have said that the Jews uh, are coming, they have stories of Jews in the Eucharist because they want to show that the Eucharist uh, is true. No, there are many, many, many stories about the Eucharist miracles without Jews involved. The Jew is the one who attacks and shows that the Eucharist, like the martyr, survives. 
And we know that, 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 that people pictured what the Jews were doing Eucharistically. There's a text from the early 13th century which says every year the Jews imolabant et communicabant with the heart of a Christian boy. Imolabant, they sacrificed. At communicabant, they took communion with the heart of a Christian boy. So that the whole thing becomes a Jewish form of Eucharist. It's a Jewish Eucharist competing with a Christian Eucharist. And there's a case in 1329 in, in Savoy, that's uh, near Mont Blanc, uh, in, in, in which it's said that the Jews put the blood in the charoset and ate it on lettuce, the moror, uh, as Svardim do, uh, and, and uh, this was for the Jews' salvation, as though Jews need a Eucharist. You ever hear of Jews needing Eucharist? I never heard of Jews needing a Eucharist. But indeed, that's what they're doing. It's, 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 it's a total competition, one against the other. And then they're going further. They're saying that uh, Christian mothers will kill, Jewish mothers will kill their children rather than have them baptized. And this is a statement which may come out of the Crusades with Jewish mothers perhaps killing their children in martyrdom. But even more, it grows so that in Rome in the 1700s, they're actually kidnapping <coughs> Jewish children. They're, they're kidnapping Jewish mothers. Jewish mothers whose children have been offered for conversion and baptizing the child immediately upon birth. What is offered means? It means that any relative has offered this child for conversion. And here is a little break in the talk to tell you something very interesting. We all know that the Catholic Church opposes abortion because it says, and not only the Catholic Church, because life, you're taking life. Now, in the Catholic thinkers, until about the 17th century, they said that there's no life until there's a soul. And that enters maybe in the 16th week or after 90 days. It's called quickening sometimes. And if you ever actually read Roe v. Wade, the famous abortion decision of the Supreme Court, you'll find they're talking about that. It's a marvelous document, and it easily comes up. Well, in order to be able to get this Jewish mother right away, you have to say that life begins right away, don't you? So I have a feeling that the whole revision and doctrine about abortion has to do with kidnapping Jewish mothers who are pregnant in order to be able to baptize their children. Now, I can't prove this, but I certainly think that that may very well be the case. The Jewish mother, by the way, is called a lamia, which is a hyena. And then there are other cases of Jews being known to, to, to make fun of the Eucharist or so uh, it has been said, but in fact it's what an important churchman in Paris named Rigord thought. He said, I see Jewish children eating dough balls in chalices, the chalice, the cup used, uh, like a kiddush cup to make the, the Eucharist. And he said, I see them, I see them uh, doing that. This is his perception of what they're doing, the same way it's his concept that the Jews have a Eucharist. I can't possibly imagine Jews publicly using these chalices and making fun of them. They knew very well that their lives were at stake for that. It's what he thinks. But the idea goes on. It goes on so much that when the Jews in Rome are finally let out of the ghetto in 1870, in the same day as the Italian monarchy is founded, a year later, we find Pius IX, we'll get back to Pius in just a moment, we find Pius saying we see the Jews latrare per le vie, we see the Jews barking through the street as though suddenly their stench and their ordure is throughout the whole town of Rome. In other words, these ideas stay on, they endure, and probably the most dangerous form or expression of this was the case of Toledo in the 13th century where it is told the virgin appears in the cathedral on the day of her annunciation, the day of her assumption in mid-August and she says there is a rabbi in the Jews neighborhood who is molding a ball of wax and he's going to crucify it. This is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? First of all, it appears in a well-known Spanish poem, the Milagros, the Praises of the Virgin. Uh, but it's dangerous because a ball of wax. How many forms can a ball of wax take? Infinite. 
So it's not only the one loaf, but it's the many, too. It's any Christian. The Jews are killing you. They're killing me. And that is really dangerous. And so these things boil down. They, they move down. It's not only these larger pronunciations. It gets down everywhere in Christian society. There's a fear of dining with Jews, a fear of sex with Jews, even a fear of Jewish Jews having Christian servants. There have been rules on the books since the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century. Jews shouldn't have Christian servants. By the, by, by, by the end of the 12th century, the Pope is saying, we absolutely have to keep Jews from having Christian servants because we don't know how they're going to corrupt them or get them perhaps ultimately to steal the Eucharist and so on and so forth. These tales go on, and they go on over time. The attempt is perhaps sometimes, not always, to convert the Jews, and they don't believe when that is going to happen. These tales get a folkloristic aspect and become popular. We find some girl in Rome in the 18th century calling a Jew a cagnaccio shatato. Now that one is really lovely. Cagnaccio, carne, you might understand dog. But what shatato? How's your Judeo-Italian? You hear the word lishchot? That's Judeo-Romanesco, which, which had passed through the Christians. You're, you're, you're a ritually slaughtered Jewish dog, a cagnaccio shaktato. Their folkloristic magical beliefs. The dog is, is the Jewish usurer who devours the blood of the town. And most extreme is actually Pius IX. Pius IX, you may know if you read David Kurtzer's book on the kidnapping of Edgardo Mortara. Pius IX believes that Edgardo has to be saved. Why? He attaches a, a, an aspect to Edgardo that Edgardo is going to somehow or other stand for all the Jews, that by doing this, he'll save the souls of everybody, even though he knows very well that the papal state will fall apart. How does he know? Because the French who give him troops and guarantee the existence of his state have told him, if, if you don't give Edgardo back, we're going to pull the troops out. And the Pope doesn't give them back. And of course, the troops go and the state falls. But why did Pius do this? First of all, he was just extreme about the whole thing. But even, even more than that, I think there's another thing here, another level. There is a figure called San Roque. San Roque protects, or San Rocco, he protects against plague. And he always has a dog. He's, whenever you see him pictured, he's pictured with a dog. And what does the dog have in his mouth? Bread. This is the good dog, the one who becomes a Christian, who eats the bread justly and properly. So for, for and, and by the way, Pius IX made made San Rocco the patron saint of some town in France. What's the conclusion? Minds are fantastic. You can't prove this. You can only think it. Edgardo for Pius IX was a form of San Roque. Was, was this whole story of San Roque. You can take this polluted Jewish dog and make him the good Jewish dog who comes and supports the saint, Pius IX himself, of course, and feeds him the pure Eucharistic bread. The story truly goes on and on and on. It continues. Supersession, the notions of supersession, as I say, continue. They continue with Benedict the Sixteenth. They continue even in Protestant circles. A friend of mine, for some reason, was in one of these mega churches near Dallas, Texas, a few months ago. And sure enough, the preacher got out, just happened to be after Yom Kippur. And the preacher got up and he said, Jonah, when he went to Nineveh, was really the prophet to the Jews. Now, this is a novel interpretation, Rabbi, something you can give when you have to think of what else can I say about the book of Jonah next Yom Kippur at Mincha? This is what you can say, that he was a prophet to the Jews to make them Christians. It will probably be the last sermon you give in the synagogue. But, <laughs> but, in any event, this indeed is what this preacher said. And then he went on to talk about the, 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 the Jews who are, who are 
who just have to become Christians and it's impossible to live with them as Jews and we have to have a mission to the Jews. Well, of course, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that mission to the Jews is sort of dead, but not completely. And even more, there's another aspect to this whole story which may be the most dangerous yet. As long as we're dealing in purely religious terms, theological terms, we know what we're dealing with, we know what we see, we can look at them, and look at people who say these things and say, well, that's what you think, this is what I think. But what happens when these ideas of the Jew as a polluter of society become secularized and the religious aspect of them becomes hidden? What happens when people talking about the founding of modern states around 1800 start to say, can the Jew fit in? Can the Jew not fit into the modern state? And they begin to say, well, the Jews in their ghettos are plotting. They're a state within the state. Isn't that a translation of the idea of the Jew trying to impurify? I would say it does. In Poland, believe it or not, toward the end of the 18th century, they're saying we have to make Jews farmers because somehow farming will reform the Jews. The idea actually is a medieval idea. Why? Because with farming we'll send Jews back to the Garden of Eden or almost back to the Garden of Eden and give them another chance. It isn't said, but that's clearly what it is. The modern state in near the French Revolution starts to talk about the regeneration of the Jews, regenerating the Jews. Regeneration really means regeneration through baptism. But now it means regeneration through their joining in the modern state. As long as you have ideas like that underneath that the Jew somehow can't continue to be a Jew but has to kind of disappear, you really have these notions of pollution that are going on. Even if people frame them and speak them in terms which have nothing to do with Christianity. And that's something to think about. The only way to get out of this is to adopt the position which was adopted by none other than George Washington when he wrote his famous letter to the Hebrew congregation at Newport in 1790, and you'll hear immediately the difference. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction to persecution, no assistance, requires only that they live under its, they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. In other words, what George Washington is saying here, there is one law. We all live under one law, but the thing which determines whether we can live under that one law is people simply fulfilling civic responsibility. There's not a hint. There's a notion of the nation, of the corpus politicum, which has taken the place of the corpus Christi, the political body, taking the place of the body of Christ, but there's no hint here of the Jews somehow or other having to reform themselves. It's just a notion of all people living under law as equals and is living under law as equals, as long as they take out the responsibility of being citizens, they can live together. Only that way can those ideas go civically. But religiously, these ideas have not totally disappeared. After all, Gibson's movie was just a couple of years ago. We've all heard the United States presidential campaign, some of the things that have been said. I, got, I really got goosebumps when Huckabee was advertising himself as the Christian leader. I wanted to get up and say, I don't want a Christian leader, I just want a leader. If you want to be a Christian leader, go somewhere else. It's not the United States. It's certainly probably, it's certainly not Canada either, one would imagine. Saints and martyrdom who were fighting other Jesuits in Rome. And why were they fighting them? Because they, the Jesuits in Belgium were condemning ritual murder and having scholarly discourse and friendship and exchange of students with Jewish students and scholars from Paris from the Society of Jewish Studies, the famous Society of Jewish Studies. And real friendship. This was a hundred years ago. It is all possible and these were Jesuits. The church also 
has undertaken a certain degree of uh, penance. We see the document we remember. Now, we remember has been judged from all kinds of angles, but it's very hard to see what's really going on there, but we know how to do it. We know there's one body. And we remember says, we have to do an act of tshuva, they use the word tshuva, since as members of the church we are linked. The church approaches with compassion the extermination of the Jews. Now what happens here? He talks about members, we, the church, they're all interchangeable. And what, what the text is really saying is though we actually said that the Nazis weren't uh, weren't part of the church, we're really admitting they were because half of them, like Hitler, were Catholics. We, the church, we are many, but we are one bread. And it works both ways. What they're really saying is that they were guilty and they have to overcome it. And that is most likely what was motivating John Paul when he got up and said the most revolutionary of things. He got up and he said, we know that the rabbinic Judaism that developed after the temple is also of God. Now that may seem like nothing. Actually, it's a theological revolution. A huge revolution. Because the whole doctrine of supersession, the whole doctrine of impurity, is based on the notion that rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism is no longer, after Jesus, is no longer valid, is no longer creative, has no longer any value after the destruction of the temple. And here was the Pope saying it has value after the destruction of the temple. In other words, Judaism for the Jews is just fine and we Christians have to stay out. We have to recognize Judaism's validity. Benedict XVI doesn't. And what's the problem? And with this I'll finish. A conference was held as long ago as 1979 and a major theologian named Kurt Ruby that begins with an H get up and said the following. Most theologians today feel that the classical description of the relationship between Judaism and Christianity has become untenable and indefensible. But when it comes to withdrawing from it, that is supersession, and from working for a new approach, they all too often do nothing and become seized by a prudence, that's in quotation marks, for which the weight of history must be largely responsible. It is hard to escape the impression that people fear that the whole structure of Christian doctrine will be made unsafe if attempts are made to do justice to Judaism and recognize it as a theological factor and a valid form of spirituality in the present. I think Ruby was right. There is that abiding fear. Thank you. Do you take questions? Yeah. One question. <laughs> Long one. Yes, um, I'll field my own questions. Yes. No, 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 no. The, the There certainly is. There certainly is. And, but, they, but they move and they manipulate within it and, and, and they, they, they can interpret and, 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 and strengthen interpretations. Popes always protect the Jews, except for one pope in 1751 who kind of suggests maybe we shouldn't protect them anymore and they come back from that. But protection, you know, you can protect the dog too by strangling. So there is a continuity. And the continuity can be, we respect, I mean, Ratzinger said, well, he was still Ratzinger. I wish I had the newspaper. I, I, I had it. He said, you know, we respect Judaism, but we also offer it a theology. In other words, we can live with you for the time being. But that's Paul in the epistle to Romans. He says, 1127, the Jews are the enemies of God for the Gospels, but his friends because of the patriarchs. The Jews aren't cut off. Paul keeps saying, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. Read the beginning of chapters 9, 10, and 11 in Romans. He keeps saying, I'm a Jew. I mean, he's thinking in different time terms, and, and he has no perspective that we have. 
So there's continuity in that. Oh, you can live with Jews. You can, you can allow them to be there. But they shouldn't for a moment think that they have the truth. And what Rubi is saying at the end so eloquently, I read him because I couldn't ever say it so eloquently, what he's saying is we have to give up on that. And until we, 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 we give up on that, we're stuck. And we have to recognize we're stuck. You had a question. Part, pardon? The picture is in Sandomir's in Poland. It's in Poland, yeah. There are, there are 12 pictures of martyrdoms all together. It's hidden. This one, it, 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 you have to sort of bend around the curve to get to it. They're not too happy about it, but they don't want to take it down. They don't want it photographed. Uh, somebody snuck it out. Uh, somebody who's Polish and they wouldn't expect to suspect her of studying Jews. Of course she does. Um, yes. Oh, you actually saw it. I saw them, but I thank you very much for explaining them a lot more. I mean, they were really enough to see. And it was still shocking to me that despite the Holocaust, they wouldn't take them down, but they have taken them down a number of them. They are hidden there. Yeah. And um, they, they finally gave in to, to, to uh, pressure, but they kept them up for such a long time, and I'm just wondering if you have an explanation. <laughs> I can't say it, even in semi-public. Uh, <laughs> he said it. Um, I'm uh, reading through the uh, biography of Abraham Joshua Heschel now, and one sees the struggle that was going on in the church at the time of Vatican II, and the uh, the efforts on the part of some people to reform church teaching and on the part of others to maintain as much of the traditional teaching about Jews as possible. Um, we would have liked to have thought that that struggle is essentially over, that Vatican II has finished, um, that um, the teachings of Nostra Aetate are firmly established. Um, what you're suggesting is that um, there is an ongoing struggle in the church. Would you perhaps elaborate on that? I'm going to go further back. I'm going to go to Nostra Aetate itself. Nostra Aetate is the statement in 1965 which said Jews were not guilty of killing Jesus, which actually, to tell you the truth, I always thought was a minor issue in, in, in Christian teaching. It, it, would come, it would come back over and again. The problem wasn't killing the original Jesus, it was killing all these martyrs uh, along the way uh, that, that was the real issue. But what is Nostra Aetate? If not a restatement without the citations, chapter and verse and name of Paul, I don't see anything new in Nostra Aetate in, in terms of theology. That's why, that's why they were able to get it to pass. Because there is this, this very heavy conservative element. You know, there are two worlds. There's the church, there are the churchmen you meet here in Toronto who may be the most liberal of people, who may in their heart of hearts say, I wish he were a Christian, but would never dare say it in public, uh, and who, who <coughs> recognize that this is a modern society. And then there's the Vatican. Now, it's very easy, I've told students even here, that it's very easy to get a temporary library card for the Vatican when the library reopens in three years. See, that's how they manipulate knowledge. Uh, the other way they manipulate knowledge is if you walk into the Vatican and want to consult the Talmud or don't know that such a thing exists, you never will know because it's located in the reading room in a, uh, on a balcony and you'd only get to the balcony if you went to look for the Talmud there. Uh, it's, uh, and then if you step one step further, you'd fall off the balcony. So you can't just pass by to have your thirst for knowledge. There's still a certain ambivalence. The Vatican, it's its own special little world which is totally detached from the 20th, let alone the 21st century. They haven't made it into the 20th yet. Although 
the, uh, the, uh, when you consult books in the library and the computer, the uh, system they use is the Aleph system, which was developed in Israel, which they bought. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can, you can live with the Jews. You just have to know how, close, how closely you can live. Nostra Aetate, apart from the question of the death of Jesus, really doesn't say, doesn't say anything. It looks forward to the day when all men will call upon God together. That means as Christians. So it's, I mean, you just t- t- take Romans in your hand, Romans 9 to 11, and Nostra Aetate, and read, and the similarities will strike you in the, in the, in the face. So I, I don't know that, that it's gone that far. How will you find, wh- wh- what will you find? I'll tell you where you find. I know the man who is the uh, head of the Inquisitional Archive in Rome. Now he's a wonderful guy and he's fun and this and that. And the other. He's, he's a Monsignor, he's Spanish. Uh, I can't, just can't remember his name, it begins with a C. Uh, and he, uh, um, uh, he, he uh, uh, will, 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 will say to you, you know, only a lunatic today would believe that Jews killed Christian children. I mean, that's what he told me. And this was, you know, it was in private. He, didn't, he wasn't uh, posing for the public. But every year I get a Christmas card from him, which is a clearly, you know, the, the, the message of the card is clear. Come and accept the light of truth. So you see, it's still there. It's still very much involved and there. Uh, and for all that he's open, well, you know, I have a, a publisher who might be interested in, in publishing inquisitional archives. Well, we have to do this, we have to, they don't want to let anything out either. So, there are, there are reservations. Yes, please. Yes. Regarding other people, well, of course, the purity laws apply. They apply in Torah Mishpacha and the uh, purity of the family and so on and so forth. They apply within Judaism. Now, are there people who would apply these laws to non-Jews? Oh, I'm sure there are. And I think we can imagine who these people are. But those people often uh, don't qualify me as a full Jew, so I'm not worried about them very much, and I assure you that I'm as halachically Jewish as possibly can be. <laughs> Sir. I have difficulty posing the question. So if we start with Constantine, when he established the church and the, uh, uh, the, the, the Godhead of Christ, and we say, and you say that Christianity is a supersessionist religion, religion. I assume then that any Jew that lives defies that statement. So can we say that supersessionism is the basis of anti-Semitism through all of the Catholic, uh, well, higher? Well, you, it, 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 it's a difficult question to pose and an even more difficult question to answer because uh, let's, let's leave aside the beginning of the thing because that requires a little more pulling apart. Uh, I wouldn't go to Constantine. But I wasn't saying that supersession itself is the origin of attitudes. Now, you'll notice I didn't say anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism in the whole talk. I don't use those terms. I try my utmost not to use those terms because they're kind of an end. The reason they did that was anti-Semitic. Well, that's an easy explanation. I'm a historian. I look for hard explanations. And what I'm trying to say here is that there is an antagonism, a fear, if you will, uh, a concern about Jews because somehow or other it's felt at least in the Middle Ages, and much less today, of course, if at all, that Jews can somehow or other pollute the Christian enterprise. In the Middle Ages, it was to the point that if you ate with a Jew, if you, if you slept with a Jew, you could be polluted, because the person would then go and take the Eucharist. Why can't Jews have Christians serving 
women in their houses because those women are then going to go take the Eucharist, but they're, but they're contaminated from eating with the Jew and they'll pass their contamination on. Uh, the, the, uh, they're afraid that Jews purposefully contaminate or despise. Uh, Innocent III has a bull about Jews trotting wine and they give the Christians the worst wine. So the worst wine enters into the uh, Eucharistic chalice. <coughs> Uh, there is a, a question about uh, uh, Jews. He said Jew, Jews uh, three days after people take the Eucharist and then his day it becomes formally obligatory for the first time and even then it's for only, uh, it's, it's only once a year. When they take it, he said they make, if they have Christian wet nurses which are illegal to begin with, they make them spill the milk out for three days. Now there's a commentary of Moshe Israelis on the Shulchan Oroch in which he says yes, because we know that uh, he said, if we don't have a choice, we use the milk. But if we do have a choice, we don't, because the the, the milk uh, with the Eucharist uh, makes makes children uh, makes the mothers foolish and the children wicked. So there are there are Jewish beliefs in the other direction too. We have to we have to really understand that. But but the but but and and they they're aware of it, so that there is certainly through the ages a kind of feeling that that Jews will will pollute us. Now if you want to say that that's anti-Semitic, it's not anti-Semitic. It's not anti-Semitic in the sense that, it, that it's actually a concern about the purity of Christianity itself. They're concerned for their own good, they're afraid. It's false, it's fictitious, it's all blown up, sure. But I think that that's really what's at the, at the heart of the issue between Jews and Christians over the age. And to the extent that it continues, the problem continues. To the extent that it doesn't continue, which is mostly, almost everywhere, then the problem doesn't continue. But when you have a Christian say to you, you know, the Jews have all the money and control the world, and I could have brought books that have come out. You can buy all kinds of books on, uh, uh, on, on Amazon, for instance, which say these things. Uh, I bought a whole flock of them before I came to Toronto. I figured I'd need them here. No, I bought them because I really want to read them and see what these people are saying. And they're there. They're just there. Uh, attempts. There's one book, a woman bringing all kinds of things from Jewish encyclopedia. I don't know what to prove that Jews are at the heart of communism. And this is from the 1930s. Henry Ford. We all know about Henry Ford. and So, on. so it's there. It's this fear of the Jew. What's there that somehow the Jew is getting into? This is what I think. Sir. Martin Gilbert, famous historian, has written a lot about the Holocaust, of course, and about the 20th century. And one of his uh, most recent books is a book called The Righteous, which is, of course, about the righteous who help to save Jewish people. The fact that the church had to keep reiterating that the Jews are evil and pollute and basically dreadful characters would indicate that there was some sort of a swell of positive feeling. In other words, would there be enough material, not necessarily for you, but for a historian to put together a book about the righteous Christians or Catholics who didn't want all of these dreadful mythologies about Jews to be uh, perpetuated? Is there, shall we say, a sunny side or an opposition well, I, I think, let me, let me just stop you because I think our time is uh, getting a little late, but I, I think I mentioned that in the talk all, all too briefly, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would love, I don't have the capacity to really do it. I need to get somebody to pay for it. You, if maybe you have money and you want to give me a year in France and I'll be able to do it. But uh, to go, we have the Christian documents of these people I mentioned who were close with Jewish servants a hundred years ago. We need to go and get the Jewish side of the whole thing. Uh, and that would make a marvelous book called A Community of Scholarship and a Community of Scholars. So yeah, yeah, th there are. Now, not so much in the Middle Ages. I mean, it's just, you know, you can't, uh, you know, what, what, what did, uh, uh, where, what is it? It's in the Sefer Yirmiyahu about making the, uh, the leopard change its spots. Uh, so I mean, in the Middle Ages, you, you, you can't make out people to be what they weren't. But it doesn't mean there weren't people. The Jews felt the Pope observes the law. The Pope observes the law absolutely. 
but uh, at least you could rely on the Pope for that. But, but no more. That was about the most. Kings, couldn't trust them at all. Please. following up that lady's uh, the question over there. We have today in the, in the Jewish community a right wing that says anybody who isn't Jewish isn't human. And anybody... Yeah, well, why, why even bother talk about them? No, all I'm saying is that we have them. I can remember my kids went to uh, Bialik, and across the street from Bialik was a time. Bialik had a fire, and they wanted their kids to use a building at a time. The a time people said, no, you're out the course and you can't use our building. So I could give you a better example, no, the famous I'm seminary the library fire. So the question, the thing is, yeah, we have our people who are, I like to call them radical right because I don't like them and anything is radical and we mm. know that it's not us. The question is, in anti-Semitism today, do you see it as part of the radical right or do you see it as a majority amongst the Christians? Oh, heaven forbid. It's, I wouldn't call it radical. Actually, the problems are much more from the radical left. The ones who, who deny the validity of Israel and the right of Israel and the people who come and talk about Israel as an apartheid country. How can it be an apartheid country? 20% of my students are Arabs. Well, uh, either way, whether it's right or left, do you feel that they are becoming again a majority of the Christian community or a minority? No, it's... it's uh, Teensy, teensy minority. It's it's not, and I and I didn't. What I what what I was trying to say was that I, I was talking. Remember, this book is an image and its interpreters. This book is not. I mean, it, I, the, this was not a praise of the book, the talk. But but what I'm talking about is ideas and how they've developed over time. I haven't said that there's a majority that hold them. There are plenty of people who don't hold these ideas. I'm sure that the Christians whom you meet. Many Muslims who you meet. I know plenty of Muslims who, who will have no truck with, uh, with, with uh, extremist Islam. The, the, they're, they're, most of the people you meet, are, you know, they, they don't care. I mean, the amazing thing, the really amazing thing is that for all these doctrines, the Jew in North America is essentially transparent. Your son, your daughter meets a non-Jew in the university, and uh, there's no problem because they're Jewish and striking up a relationship wherever it may lead. It just isn't there. It just isn't there. It's it's what I'm talking about is the Catholic Church being able to break its old doctrines and accept Judaism as a t in total equality because that will really uh, open the door uh, to. Uh, to a different kind of attitude. But I'm only talking about that. I'm not talking about the Christian that you meet every day on the street. That person couldn't care less, most likely.